for Red Hat, uh, and I also act as a tech lead for the Siemens Foundation. Uh, and today with me, uh, there is Patrick that is working for Intel, and he is the uh, Structured Logging Working Group organizer, uh, and he will be talking later about uh, more things on logging. Um, so today, what we will talk about, um, we'll do an introduction about the group, uh, what is the, the purpose of this group, and what we are doing upstream, um, as well as we'll cover the different activities that we are responsible of, uh, which are, for example, some subproject related to observability in Kubernetes, as well as the different observability signals that are really common nowadays, such as like logging, tracing, and uh, monitoring. And then uh, I will kind of teach you how you can also contribute and help us uh, building observability on Kubernetes in a, in a better way, uh, and where you can find us if you have any question or anything really. Um, so what do we do? So first, if you are not really familiar with how the development cycle works in Kubernetes, um, like we are split into groups that are called a special interest group, um, and there are many of them, and all of them have a particular focus. And uh, in the case of instrumentation, well, uh, the main focus is observability, and uh, all these uh, groups have a charter that they define at the creation of the group, that basically give the baseline of uh, what's the purpose of this group and what it is going to cover. Um, in our case, uh, that's an extract of the official charter that, that we have for the group. And uh, we are meant to cover the best practices for cluster observability across all Kubernetes components, so in the Kubernetes project, as well as develop new components and new projects around observability uh, in Kubernetes as a whole. Um, so we are not only working on uh, the Kubernetes repository in the Kubernetes project. We're also working on many sub-projects uh, that are covering observability in Kubernetes, such as KubeState metric, um, that is producing metrics based on the Kubernetes states, uh, so based on the API, uh, as well as, for example, Klog, uh, that is uh, a logging library that we are using uh, in Kubernetes a lot. And of course, like many projects that uh, use Kubernetes as a library, for example, or a client, there is also Metrics Server, that is uh, a project used for auto-scaling based on resource metrics. Uh, that is part of our responsibilities. Uh, and there are many, many more. So uh, we are kind of split between like working on uh, the official Kubernetes project as well as like many other uh, sub-projects. And we are also working a lot on all the different observability signals uh, that you might have already seen in Kubernetes. So metrics, logs, events as well, and traces. So how do we do that? Well, we really, like, like any other uh, group, uh, we are triaging and fixing the relevant issues that are assigned to us. Um, and how it, uh, how it works upstream is that uh, we have labels that identify uh, issues or PR that are related to a particular group, and then we just go through them uh, and try to see uh, what can we do. And sometimes it's uh, like the person that opened the ticket that assigned us, or sometimes it's just someone that triaged that put us on the list of people that should review uh, the thing. Uh, we also try generally to review all the new addition to metrics or all the changes related to metrics, because uh, we really want to uh, have a high quality of metrics in Kubernetes. Um, but uh, the review is like stricter depending on the stability of the metric. So if it's a new metric, we might not review it. But if it's uh, a metric that will become stable, we'll definitely review it. Um, and we're also involved a lot on features development and announcement related to observability as well. So if anyone uh, in the project has any issues with observability or uh, if there is any gaps, then we will try to cover it. And as I mentioned before, we are maintaining a lot of subprojects. So for the subproject, uh, I will speak about three of them because like, they are the ones that I'm the most familiar with and that I contribute to. Um, so CubeSafe Metrics, Metrics Server, and Prometheus Adapter. So for CubeSafe Metrics, for those who don't know, and I'm not too familiar with like, the Prometheus terminology. It's uh, meant to be uh, an exporter. So um, the goal is to create metrics and expose metrics based on a third party application that, doesn't, that isn't meant to be monitored, for example, such as the Kubernetes API. We have a lot of objects in Kubernetes, and sometimes you want to have metrics about them. Let's say you want metrics about your pod, your deployment, your set, stateful set. Well, KubeSafe uh, metric will be the tool that generates uh, primitive style metrics based on those. And for example, on the slide, we have like uh, two of them that are deployment-related metrics. The first one gives you the number of replica that the deployment uh, should have in the spec. 
And the second one uh, is the status of the uh, recent update of the deployment. So it basically tells you if uh, an update, uh, like a rollout, for example, has been completed or not. So it's really useful when you want to, for example, investigate issue related to a deployment that hasn't completed, for example, or stuff like that. And it does so by uh, watching for all kind of events, so creation, updates uh, of objects in Kubernetes, and then expose the metrics, and then you have your platform that will ingest these metrics since like, it's a text-based format, like any platform can really uh, ingest the metrics and use them. Um, for metrics server, metrics server is a project a bit different. Um, it's an implementation of uh, a metric API that is the resource metrics API. Um, so we have like three API that we maintain actively, uh, which are meant as a way to communicate between the auto-scaling pipeline and uh, the metrics, and it's um, a way to have uh, auto-scaling based on metric, basically. And over the years, uh, we've seen many use cases uh, for this that were not uh, designed by default. For example, kubectl top, which is used a lot nowadays to get the usage of a pod and to try to track uh, in a Linux way, for example, like Linux top, um, the usage of your, your pods and containers. Uh, then that, that was uh, created based on this uh, API, as well as well, resource-based auto-scaling. So if you have an HP and you want to auto-scale your pods um, based on, I don't know, if they reach 50% uh, uh, CPU usage, then you will use a uh, metric server. Um, Prometheus Adapter is a project that is fairly similar. Uh, it's also meant for auto-scaling, but it, it's supporting a uh, well larger amount of metrics instead of only Having uh, the resource metrics for auto-scaling, you will only be able to auto-scale on any kind of metric. So for example, if you want to auto-scale your uh, microservice based on the number of query per second that it is receiving, then you can use a project such as Prometheus Adapter to do so. Um, and what it does basically is that uh, it adapts the query that comes from the API server. So let's say you have an auto-scaling request um, that should go to through this API, and Prometheus Adapter will convert it into PromQL um, query, query Prometheus with that, and then return you the results. So you can imagine that you can then, via this adapter, convert really anything into a Prometheus query and auto scale based on it. And then uh, I will let Patrick talk about the logs. Okay. So. As you, as you know, SIG instrumentation owns two different things, the metrics and as another pillar of observability, the logging infrastructure and log output to some extent. But most really we just maintain the infrastructure and help other SIGs to write good log calls into their code and help guide them towards producing better log output. And one of the initiatives that has been started a while ago was to rethink what a log message should look like from a Kubernetes component. Originally, it was inherited from K-Log. It's just a plain string with no format whatsoever to it. And you, if you need to look into that string, you basically need to do regular expression matching or crabbing or something, and it's, it's fairly informal. What we are trying to achieve now is so-called structured logging, where the output contains clearly separated log message, a string, ideally constant, and key value pairs in an easy to form a pass format. The text output still exists, it's useful for debugging for developers, but we also now support outputting the same data as JSON. And the idea here is that any kind of log ingestion pipeline will be easier to implement if we if we use the JSON format. So that's the structured logging. It's implemented as rewriting source code, replacing one unstructured log call from in K-Log with another variant that takes key value pairs and the rest is taken care of in K-Log. But it means touching a lot of code and that's what we are organizing and we've done that work with the help of quite a lot of contributors and, and helpful people with Kubelet that was already completed in 121. And we also completed that work in Skube Scheduler in the lift, just, just the current uh, Kubernetes 124. There was one final blocker, and what, that was related to multi-line output of strings. 
uh, it became unreadable if it was a quoted string, and we changed that in the K-log text output for when 124 is of it. It remains useful even also in the text output. And with that change, we converted basically the last remaining to a lock call in Cube Scheduler, and we consider it done. This is just for the Cube Scheduler code itself. It will still call into functions from client Go, for example, that don't use structured logging, but then those appear as a single string as they did before. So you can turn on JSON and you get all new JSON outputs from these two components. You can also turn it on in all of the other components. It just won't be very structured. It will still have only that string. And that's where we need help further going on, uh, going further. To, to continue this effort, but I'll, I'll get to that when I present the working group that I'm a part of. We also own or kind of are the de facto maintainers of K-Log implementation itself. One thing that we observed in Kubernetes is that for historic reasons, we have lots of command line options in, in K-Log that we don't think fit into a container like a log file handling that really should be handled by whoever ingests uh, the, the data. So we want to deprecate and we have deprecated all flags related to uh, log file handling, for example. There's a longer list of things that only make sense in very specific scenarios. So these are now marked deprecated in Kubernetes, but still available. If you get a warning, if you try to ha still, still call them, and we will remove them in 126. So the clock is ticking. If you are calling Kubernetes components with some of these flags, you should better start removing those, those options. Uh, the main goal here is, or it was, to remove or get rid of that code that we don't really need in Kubernetes. But we kind of rethought our approach here, and we will continue to support them in K-Log itself. It's just that the Kubernetes components won't use them. So if you are a user of K-Log, rest assured, nothing, we're not breaking your application that is based on K-Log. It will just make Kubernetes simpler. Uh, and the other purpose is that if we have a JSON backend that writes log messages, it's basically a really different code path that is being taken. And things like increased verbosity by a module, which is a, one of these K-log options, that won't work if you use JSON. But that's, that's now fully documented. You see which options are supported and which are not. And there's a cap that's linked here with more details. Now, the, the new feature that I've been working on in 124 is basically a continuation of that structured logging work. With structured logging, you still call a global K-log function to output a log message. And it's using the globally configured logger. It will be the same for all Go routines in your program. And contextual logging goes one step further. It uses an abstract logging interface, Go logger. You have some utility code in K-Log to extract that logger from your context that gets passed into your call chain. And then you can do calls through that local logger that is specific to the current call chain. And the caller basically determines what that logger does. It can do things like adding a certain key value pair, and it will be printed by every single log message inside that call chain. That's useful if you are doing request pro pro processing and you have concurrency, so multiple things going on at the same time, printing logs, now you will see what each log message is about. And that was not possible before. We are going to use that in Cube Scheduler, for example, to include the pod that is being scheduled in all calls. And that, that also works in code that doesn't even know that it's working on a pod because it's part of a context. My own favorite use case is logging in unit tests because now the output can be redirected into testing T log. And Go test will just show me the log messages for my failed test case and not all of the rest things, all of the rest of the log messages that are not of no interest to me. So as, as I said, we are not going to break K log users. All of the code, if you are importing a Kubernetes library, will work with a global K log logger as default. But we, we make it so that if your code, a library is instrumented, is supporting this, it, it basically can also work without, depending on, on K-log output, for example. You can have your own logger. You can repl completely replace the logging backend in your binary and make sure that, and you will, will be a, can rest assured that K-log based code, Kubernetes code, will pick it up and use it. And that's 
part of it, we started that work because it also, again, needs to touch all of these source code lines that do lock calls in Kubernetes. And going forward, we'll combine both. We will go straight to the contextual logging function calls. They also have very similar parameters. So the previous work on structured logging will be Will be, was the first step, now we need to take another step and replace the global logger. That's what we are now going to do also in other components. So, uh, Damien introduced the SIG. This whole work on structured logging is organized as a working group. That's another concept in Kubernetes. It's basically a smaller subset of people who meet independently of a larger SIG. It has separate organizers. I'm, I'm one of them now, uh, to work with Marek, who's, who's not here today. Um, and we don't own the code, so any kind of triaging code ownership still rests with SIG instrumentation, but it's a good way to get started uh, getting your, your, your feet wet with doing some Kubernetes work because it's a smaller group. You can, it's less distracting also. Like I, I don't know much about metrics, for example. I've used them, but I don't attend, usually attend for SIG meetings, so I, I learned something today about metrics. <laughs> uh, but this is a, basically a subset, different subset of, of work that we are doing. And you're welcome to join our Slack, uh, our Zoom meetings, show up on our Slack, because we do need help. This is, ba this is basically, to some extent, busy work, but it's also interesting because you get to see a lot of code, get a lot of experience, exposure in the community. It's a good way to get started in Kubernetes, in, in my opinion. And, and for contextual logging, you actually need to understand a little bit. It's not just cut and paste. We really need to make some some investigations about what's the best way to pass in a logger into a certain code base. So it, I, I think it's a good way to get started, and we are looking forward to contributors. Thanks. And yeah, now I will present you the work we've been doing on tracing uh, recently, and most likely like the, um, yeah, what we've done to build the experience around tracing. It's been an issue for a while, and we've been trying to improve that over the years uh, by designing the features and starting to implement it. Um, and w the original goal that we want to, wanted to achieve was to be able to trace uh, any kind of request that is made to the API server and to be able to know um, where it went, or how long does it took to, for example, um, return from etcd, how long etcd took to um, like do the work there and stuff like that. Um, so we wanted um, to have uh, tracing available for the whole control plane. Um, so we added tracing to GPA server uh, in 122 and it reached alpha. We are still working currently on like promoting it to beta uh, and it should be happening in the upcoming releases and it will now be uh, available by default on uh, Kubernetes. Um, and it was also added to etcd because like we wanted the full experience, right? Uh, of like distributed tracing uh, in Kubernetes. So uh, the support was added to etcd in v3.5.0, but it's still experimental in the same way as in Kubernetes. So you will need to enable it uh, yourself if you want to start using this feature. Um, and we've also had use cases uh, where people wanted to also add tracing because like it was working well in the API server, so why not add it, adding it somewhere else, right? Um, so it's like some effort started around like pod life cycle. Uh, and there is an ongoing effort uh, to add tracing to the kubelet. Uh, it was supposed to actually land in uh, 123, uh, 124 and start being available now, but we were a bit late, so maybe in the upcoming releases you will be able to see that. Uh, and also, like when we started this discussion, uh, some people from the container runtime also were interested uh, by this feature, uh, and now it's available in Cryo and ContainerD, and you can enable it uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and yeah, we've had also uh, some users of tracing that started seeing gaps uh, in the current solution and had some ideas to improve it. Uh, one of them was to add context uh, at every point uh, into every controller so that we can follow uh, the actual requests that are made from one controller to another and propagate that into the, the tracing so that we have an overview really of what happened. Uh, and this is still in discussion as well. Um, so I will give you a quick example of how it works today uh, to have like tracing in uh, the control plane. Uh, so since uh, the feature is not uh, is still like alpha and it's still like experimental, you need to enable the API server tracing feature gate at first. 
uh, and then to configure it, it's pretty easy. Like uh, a lot of configuration in the GPA server, you need to uh, add the CLI flag and then add a config file to specify uh, the configuration of your, your tracing. Uh, in this case, the example just showed very basic uh, tracing configuration with a one person sampling rate. Uh, and in a CD to create the same, you need to set uh, a CLI flag in order to enable the feature since it's not available by default. Uh, and then the only thing that you really need to, to set up in order to start tracing uh, your cluster is to have open telemetry collectors running as a sidecar of like each of the, like for example, the ABS server container and the HCD container. And that's about it. Then you can send the traces to whichever backend you want and start uh, using this amazing feature. Um, and this is an example uh, that was done uh, with Jaeger, but you could use anything really, uh, of like the result that was achieved with this feature. Uh, we can see different spans. Um, the first one in two are from the API server, so you can see where the API server spent time when the request was received. Uh, same for etcd, like you have etcd in a range, um, and you also have like for some requests, they may be eating a webhook, for example. Um, so you will also have that, uh, and you will be able to see really like where the time was spent. And if you ever had to investigate issues with uh, slowness, for example, of a microservice of like, or like any kind of latency issue, you most likely had a bad experience because it's really hard to figure out where the problem is coming from. It could be network, it could be your application, and then if it's your application, where exactly in the application did it happen? And with tracing, this is something that we can see uh, more easily, I would say, because you can really see like what was the factor that made your request slow. Um, so that's the key behind this feature. Uh, and now I'll talk about like metrics. Uh, as you might have seen as uh, Kubernetes users, we have a lot of metrics in, uh, in Kubernetes. And that's because most of the components in Kubernetes have uh, default integration with Prometheus, like they are all using the Prometheus client to expose metrics in a text-based format um, and in their metrics endpoint, and that can be scraped by really anyone. Uh, like you can use any kind of time series database that is compatible with the Prometheus format and that would work, but in most cases it's still Prometheus that is used because uh, it's like the most common nowadays. Uh, but over the years, we've encountered many issues uh, with metrics. You might have faced some of them, uh, but what we saw is that there was a reoccurring uh, problem, which was related to memory. Like there were some spikes in memory usage. Uh, sometimes there was some memory leaks that we detected, and the issue is that like we were seeing metrics that were growing, growing, and growing, uh, with never stopping. And the problem was related to metric cardinality which is a concept where, for example, you take this uh, metric that could be a metric for many uh, microservices, um, then the metric has some labels, and you can consider labels as, as a, a dimension, and then the label name would be uh, the width of your metric. So let's say in this case we have a width of three, we have the verb code and pass label, and then for each uh, label, there will be label value. And that's the height of uh, each label. So for example, uh, here for the verb, we have a height of four, same for the code, and the pass is one. Um, and then if you really want to estimate like how many time series your metric will generate, uh, well, it's pretty simple. Um, a time series is basically um, the, like a unique set of label values. So for example, put 200 on the pod path, will be one time series, put uh, 201 on the podpass will be another time series, post uh, 200 on the podpass will be the same. So you can see where it is going like, each value will multiply with one another. So here the, cardinality, the theoretical cardinality would be four times four times uh, one, right? Um, so that can be problematic in a sense if uh, you have a label at some point that have an unbounded number of values for example, a URL. a URL is simple, but well, if someone eats your API and you are like, no matter the path that is queried, you are producing a metric, then that means they have control over the, the actual values that the path can take. And the problem is that there is some security concern with that because, well, they can basically create metrics that will be stored in your monitoring platform uh, by themselves. And if they 
query basically a million paths that doesn't make any sense, then you will store them in your monitoring platform. And in most cases, if you don't have uh, any kind of security features enabled, um, then your monitoring platform will be down. Uh, you, will have, like, you will be in the dark in your cluster and stuff like that. So it's something to be considered. And since it was hitting a lot of people in uh, the Kubernetes community, we've tried um, to put something in place in order to, to cover that. Um, so we've introduced a framework that is meant as a way to define the fact that a metric is an immutable API uh, in the sense that if someone ever were to add a, a new label that would take a thousand value, well, they won't be able to do so because like, the metric would have been stable and it wouldn't be possible. So that's what we call the metric stability uh, framework. Uh, and the idea was that we added some um, checks in order to verify that whenever a metric is stable, it's impossible uh, as a developer to add new labels to it. Like, we have check in CI that prevents that, um, and we will like, you see it as one immutable API, like any other API that reaches stable at some point. Um, but like, we noticed that it wasn't enough. We were still seeing the issues because like, well, you cannot see anything, and even maybe some uh, alpha metrics are also uh, causing uh, like cardinality explosion, right? Um, so uh, what we did was that we had a thought with, which was that when you need to fix this kind of problem uh, in the project itself, sometimes it's, it takes a while just to get the fix in. Then uh, sometimes like the problem was from like two releases ago, so you need to do a backport which takes a lot of time, and as a user of Kubernetes, you might see the fix like maybe uh, one or two months after really the patch, right? And after you encounter the issue. So we added this tool that is a metrics cardinality enforcement tool that um, allows you in each component of Kubernetes to specify your CLI flag in order to uh, like specify the metrics that you want to remove in case like they are exploding, because like, we are developers, we might make mistakes, so mistakes might happen, but we want to give you a way at runtime you know, to be able to fix this kind of problem if they ever occurs. Um, so this is what we built to solve this issue. Um, and we have some other ideas around that because um, the stability framework is great, uh, but we want to use it to improve the quality of the, the metrics that we have. Um, so in the feature development process in Kubernetes, we have like different stages, uh, which is alpha, beta, and stable. But in the metrics uh, stability framework, we only have two. We only have alpha and stable. So we want to add beta in order to add a bit more explosiveness to this framework. Because today it was like either um, the, we could change anything in the metric because the metric was alpha, or it was stable and we couldn't change anything anymore. Like there was no thing we could do to the metric. We want you to add more explosiveness, as well as there is a big problem in Kubernetes that you might have faced is that there are many metrics, and there is no actual documentation to really know which metric does what, and even like what are the metrics that are available to me. Um, so we want to build an automated documentation that gives you the power to really use metrics. Uh, and yeah, get involved. Like we are a very welcoming community. Uh, we are always looking for new contributors. Um, and the best way to start is to start attending our SIG meetings because um, that's where we usually meet and onboard people. Um, the things you can do, like there are many ways to contribute. You don't have to just contribute code. You can do reviews, you can uh, fill issues, you can uh, contribute to the documentation and stuff like that. And since at the beginning of the talk, I said that we have like many sub-projects uh, as part of the instrumentation uh, group. Um, there are many of them that are looking for contributors, new contributors, new reviewers, and stuff like that. So if you are interested in one of them, uh, feel free to reach out to the person in charge, and they will be very happy to onboard you. Um, for the meetings that we are running, the SIG meetings, we have a regular one that is uh, bi-weekly where we discuss like general topics for the group. Uh, it occurs at uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on uh, Thursdays, and like, it's one time it's the meeting, the other time it's the triage, and triage is more like we go through issues, we go through the PRs and make sure that someone is assigned to it and looking at it uh, actively. But other than that, you can reach out to us 
on the single instrumentation Slack channel. Uh, we should be fairly active there. Or if you have any like question that you want to ask uh, to the lead directly, feel free to reach out to any of them. Uh, they will be very happy to to answer all your questions and to start onboarding you in that. Um, and yeah, that's about it for the talk. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we don't have any questions online. So if you want to ask questions, raise your hand and I will bring the microphone. Hi. Uh, first, thanks. And uh, so you mentioned about tracing, uh, setting it up and running a collector as a sidecar, uh, which not, doesn't seem very easy when using uh, managed Kubernetes, such as EKS. Do you have a solution for that, or are you working with providers to provide those kind of solutions? Mm. Uh, on top of my end, I, I don't think we've considered even supporting it like by default, like running the sidecar ourselves in Kubernetes, because we don't want to like take a position in like choosing, for example, the open telemetry collector or like any other future collector that might uh, be created at some point. Uh, but I think yeah, some vendors are actively uh, trying to onboard tracing in general. But we will see, like, it's still very early to take that kind of decision and even for vendors to onboard this feature. Um, so the more stable it will become, the more likely it will be that, uh, like, for example, GKE, uh, Azure, or whichever, like, cloud uh, will start supporting this feature, yeah. And regarding the tracing, I was wondering, uh, which is the idea? The user should enable it whenever he sees an issue, or uh, the idea is to have it always enabled? And if so, which is the overhead? Um, I think the overhead is still quite big. It, it depends on the sampling rate. Um, but it's mostly a way for us developers of, for example, components in Kubernetes to see if we have any uh, latency regression to then handle them, or for you uh, users to really empowers you to know like where is my problem um, let's say tracing to me is a mean for uh, investigating your SLOs like if you have a problem with your SLO your availability is uh, degrading then it is a mean for you to notice a hey, uh, the problem is coming from etcd the problem is coming from the API server and then you can know exactly like where it is coming from but the overhead is still quite big so yeah uh, I think it's more like if you encounter this issue at some point, I think yeah, it's a good way to say, yeah, I, maybe I need to enable tracing. Okay. Um, but it's more like depending on the budget that you have and how much you can afford. Because like the more signal, signal you have, the easier it will be for you to investigate any kind of problems. Uh, but it depends on the budget. Like sometimes it's something that you need to enable, so you need to choose whether like it seems worse or like you don't have the budget for it. Thanks. Hey, so thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the for the talk. So I, I have a question related to to logs, but uh, perhaps more to the uh, the logs for applications that run in the cluster rather than the the logs of control plane components itself. And this this information may be out of date, but l last time I checked, it was not super easy to collect logs from application running in the cluster, right? You you either will need to go to the CRI, which requires quite some privilege that may not available everywhere, or modify the application code to send the logs somewhere. So my question would be, is there any, any plans or uh, are there any uh, ideas yeah. of how to make a bit easier to collect logs for the application running in the, in the cluster? So conceptually, at least, a containerized application should be writing to standard out or standard error. And then it's the job of the container runtime and the container orchestrator to do something with that data. Uh, Marek, my co-organizer, co he is interested in that topic. He wants to investigate how to make it more performant. But there are no specific plans at this time. But, so if you are interested in that low-level part and how to feed that data into log collection agents, Marek would be the person to ask for because he was, he's probably going to do something or look into that fairly soon. Okay, we have one more minute for the last question. Anyone?
All right. I think we are done. Thanks. Thank you.